what, where the temperatures drop to minus 90 centigrade at night on Mars. And uh, a whole array of survival tips are, are given because you don't want to end up as a frozen statue put on display in Loser's Row at the New Plymouth Cemetery. Uh, once again, uh, recovering parachutes uh, for the material uh, is a business opportunity for those with a fast transport. Um, as is sal uh, uh, obtaining aluminum from local resources. Um, and here's another informal uh, salvage operation underway at the New Plymouth uh, spaceport. Okay, the, the moon base. Okay, now, see, Mars is different from the moon in that Mars has the resources necessary for human settlement. Okay, uh, the, the carbon, for example, is plentiful on Mars, and we are carbon-based life forms. Everything that is alive incorporates carbon. Everything we eat was once alive. Uh, all the most practical fuels use hydrocarbon molecules or alcohols, um, plastics, wood, cloth, um, a whole array of necessary materials all use carbon. It's completely plentiful on Mars. Carbon dioxide is 95% of the Martian atmosphere, whereas it's only present in parts per million on the moon. Hydrogen is plentiful on Mars. There are places on Mars, continent-sized regions on Mars, I should say, that are 60% water by weight in the soil. Uh, compared to the moon where it may only hypothetically exist in parts per million quantities near the poles. Nitrogen, well, nitrogen is the minority constituent to the Martian atmosphere, it's essentially absent on the moon. So all the key elements of life um, are plentiful on Mars where they're absent on the moon. So for instance, on the moon, shit would be more valuable than gold. So this provides a business opportunity to Martian colonists. Um, in that this is a good way to dispose of your waste products, okay? Sell it to the moon. And as he characterizes the moon as an interplanetary pay toilet operating in reverse. They pay you to make deposits. And so um, here is, uh, and because by the way, it is cheaper from the energy point of view, a lot cheaper to ship material to the Earth's moon from Mars than it is from the Earth because Mars has uh, less than half the escape velocity of the Earth. So it requires only about a third the energy to go from Mars to the Moon as it does to go from the Earth to the Moon. Um, there's a section dealing with uh, agriculture uh, and uh, the certain ironic consequences of decisions that were made earlier in the space program. Uh, there's actually a book that was written in the 1980s uh, based on NASA reports uh, on uh, future extraterrestrial agriculture that um, comes to the conclusion that the ideal livestock for an extraterrestrial colony is goats. They're much more convenient size than cattle, and yet they do yield milk, which like rabbits don't, for example. Um, and they're very hardy, and they can eat almost anything. And uh, therefore, they're, they're, goats is the way to go, according to uh, NASA thinking, uh, and thus they became the dominant livestock on Mars. Uh, however, okay, I'm originally from Brooklyn, and I'm, don't, I'm not a farm boy, but I have lived about 20 years of my life in a rural area, and uh, so I know what goats can do, and believe me, you don't want them in a Mars colony, um, because yes, they do eat anything. Um, Okay. And they're also quite nimble, and especially in 1/3 G, they could do quite a job. So, uh, however, there's an upside to this: is chasing after uh, uh, goats that have escaped uh, can keep the uh, Mars Authority personnel busy while serious people do their business without undue interference, um, as shown here. By the way, this is Founders Square in New Plymouth, um, which is the center of the colony. It's domed over. And uh, what you see there in the center of the square is one of the early HABs, in fact, the first HAB, which is called the Beagle. If you've read my novel, First Landing, that's the, ha the name of the HAB that was used in there. And there's a statue there of, of Rebecca Sherman, who was the uh, biologist, the exobiologist on the first mission. We'll discuss a little bit more about her uh, soon. Uh, now, of course, it's not enough just to know how to live on Mars. You have to know how to get ahead, how to make money. He talks about various jobs that you can get at Mars. Some people get their first job at the spaceport. If you do, you definitely want to know the launch schedule. 
um, construction work, and so forth. Um, uh, but in fact, he, construction work's a good first job on Mars because you learn how to use all the tools and you learn the ropes and so forth. But as soon as possible, he, wants, he advises people to get into uh, uh, private enterprise. Um, the, um, and uh, for instance, uh, staking mining claims on Mars. And you'll get a sense of, of his view. He, he talks a bit about how there could be all kinds of precious minerals on Mars. Because Mars has had a geologic history in many respects similar to Africa, where there are, of course, very abundant precious metal deposits that have been formed for various geological reasons that are explained. Um, so he, he names a whole bunch of uh, ores that could potentially exist. Um, and he says, um, all of these possess sufficient sales value on the terrestrial market that they could potentially be lifted to orbit and transported back to Earth and sold for a substantial profit. While this has not actually been done yet, the fact that it could clearly be done in the future defines Martian precious metal ores as a resource of tremendous value. All you have to do to get fantastically rich is to go out to do a little good old-fashioned prospecting work and stake a claim, which you can sell off to others to utilize. And the beauty of it is that since actual mining operations are still well in the future, it doesn't matter how much your precious metal your claim really contains, or if it contains any at all. Thus, your success is virtually guaranteed. This is in marked contrast to the business of geothermal wealth prospecting, which is much riskier, as such claims may be subjected to attempted exploitation in the relatively near future. It should be noted that in selling precious metal mining claims based on optimistic interpretation of the field data, you are not putting your customer at risk. Assuming he possesses any skill at all in his business, he should be able to resell the property at a considerable profit regardless, far from harming anyone by transforming previously worthless geographic locations into marketable property, you are creating wealth, thereby enlarging the pie of well-being that sustains all of humanity. Having done the work to confer this blessing, it simply stands to reason that you should be the one who gets the wealth in question first. The great metropolitan stock exchanges of Earth, which have done so much good, enriching millions of people with trillions of dollars by trading in companies that never produce anything, all work in accord with exactly the same principle. <laughs> okay, so he understands the economy. Um, uh, discusses uh, airplane flight, and uh, he critiques many early ideas. This is an illustration from a, a NASA Ames uh, airplane concept and he, uh, of the 20th century. And as you can see, uh, they did not understand that the propeller needs to spin. Uh, discusses uh, the opportunities for making wealth from exploiting the asteroids. Once again, the asteroid belt is uh, uh, much easier to access from Mars than it is from Earth. Uh, and he has a business plan that he invites you to invest in. OK. Um, yeah, now he discusses how to become famous on Mars. Uh, and the most famous person on Mars in the early 22nd century when this book was written uh, is uh, Rebecca Sherman. Rebecca Sherman was the exobiologist on the first human mission to Mars, and, which, by the way, is discussed in my book, First Landing. Um, and it's remarkable that she's the most famous because she was by no means the most essential crew member in terms of functionality in the crew. She, at best, was in the middle of the pack, kind of a difficult person, but nevertheless, uh, she is the one who uh, discovered life on Mars and therefore is uh, interplanetary renowned. And here is the statue of her in uh, Founders Square, New Plymouth. And I don't know if you can read the inscription on the bottom, but it says, Rebecca Sh Sherman, explorer, pioneer, scientist, uh, visionary, and celebrity. Um, and then on the other side, it says, to the world, she gave a world, uh, which, by the way, is what it says exactly on the side of the statue of Christopher Columbus in Columbus Circle in New York City. And for some reason, he's uh, standing in exactly the same pose as her. Um, I don't know why, um, but there it is. Now, uh, but okay, so she discovered microbial life on Mars. How can you do that? Okay, um, okay, well, as he points out, you know, uh, he says, you know, but how can I do that, you ask? Surely all the great discoveries have already been made, either by Sherman or the few who followed immediately after. Not so, 